disinfecting the air in our schools. This is very important. Schools are important. Air is important. And disinfecting is important, too. And for this discussion, we have Dwayne Ashimini, and uh, he is a, an expert in such things uh, at Energy Industries, which was originally created in the 90s by Darren Kimura, who is a friend of this show. I don't know where he is right now, but we we know we know Darren well, and uh, any any friend of Darren is a friend of ours. <laughs> Wayne, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate the time. So we want to talk about your technology for a minute, and let me let me restate some of what uh, I understand about it. So you you have you have air in a given classroom or room where people are you know close together, and and the air circulates around them. It picks up um, bacteria, it picks up virus, it picks up mold. Um, and the, the way the, the air circulates often enough is it goes, goes higher, it goes to the top of the room, and then it comes back down again. When it comes back down, uh, then you get an infection. And uh, that, secondary, that secondary infection is, is really what, what creates the spreader. So we have to hit it when it's up high. Uh, and hopefully we have enough depth in the room, enough height in the room, uh, so that we can catch it when it's up there. Now, early on in COVID, I recall... Um, that the hospitals were uh, were buying these um, UV light things, and they would they would put it in a, in, a, in a hospital room and let it and let it flash around circular motion, okay, to to kill everything in the room. Nobody could be in the room when it was there because it has a deleterious effect on people, um, okay. And and you have got a much more sophisticated arrangement right now where you can go into a school. Um, and you can you can kill the mold, the bacteria, uh, or or the uh, virus uh, up, up high in the classroom, uh, even while people are there. And that's a tremendous advantage. Uh, otherwise, you know, it, it's not nearly as useful. And uh, and uh, here I have a, I have a I have a, a trick question for you, Mike. <laughs> and we'll start out with my trick question. You know, <clears throat> we used to joke around about thermos bottles, mm -hmm. and uh, my partner in the firm always used to ask me. How does it know the difference? How does the thermos bottle know the difference? How does it know the difference between mold and bacteria and virus? Now that's high tech. <laughs> 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 so uh, my first question to you is how does it know the difference? Actually, um, you know, with UVC light, it's, it reacts or deactivates all of those. So it doesn't really matter. Um, you can have molds, mildews, you know, you can have bacteria or viruses. And what is really interesting is just that the extent of energy and the amount of time of exposure required. Viruses tend to be much more fragile. So exposure energies and exposure times are less. Uh, whereas to opposite side of the scale, molds and mildews tend to be much more resistant. Mm. And so exposure times and energy levels to deactivate those takes a little bit longer. So the great part is we don't really have to decide. It, it just kind of does it. Deactivation. What does that mean? You know, in terms, for example, well, of any of those things, uh, bacteria, mold, or virus, um, how, how do you deactivate an antigen like that? Well, it actually affects the DNA uh, within the virus or the bacteria or the spool, and it, it stops it from being able to replicate or, or duplicate. So that's what it does. It pretty much like makes it sterile to some degree. Okay, so it can't replicate, I suppose, yeah. um, and it, it can't uh, attack human beings. Yeah, so, so you know, if it does get, you know, if we do breathe it in, you know, it, it's in the act, in, it's inactivated. I, I guess that's the word. I guess. Yeah. So, what about the hospitals? You know, I remember this is God three years ago. Seems an, an age ago, actually. Uh, the hospitals were doing this, and you know, everybody was, you know, considering this a, a promising technology. Is it still being done in hospitals? Yeah. Aside absolutely. from the schools you're going to talk about today, is it being done, you know, in other rooms where people gather? Yeah, actually, you know, we've been doing UVC lighting now for probably about 15, 20 years. I don't know if you remember, but there was a big scare about the outbreak of tuberculosis and drug-resistant tuberculosis. So at that time, a lot of the nursing homes, the senior care facilities, and the hospitals started putting UVC lights in their air handling units, you know, in their large units, like, and that was to deactivate or actually would serve a couple of purposes. It would clean up the, the coils, the coils inside the air conditioning units. And then if any of the bacteria or viruses attached onto the coils, 
it would deactivate them at that level. So, so yes, you are correct, but it actually has been around for a lot longer than that. Yeah, you know, there was uh, on the conversation on Hawaii Public Radio a couple hours ago, um, there was uh, uh, Lei Wai Du, who used to be a city council member, and he's that. been a lifelong victim of, of polio. Okay. And, and it was newsworthy because, you know, polio is coming back. Um, there are cases of, of wild polio and I guess domesticate, domestic, I don't know what the difference is, polio uh, emerging around the world now. And it's very, very uh, shocking. The stalk vaccine, which was all the rage when I was a kid, um, you know, apparently didn't stop it altogether. And it's, it's back and it's a virus. It's a virus. And uh, Lei Wai Du was down there talking about it. It was really, it was like, Deja vu all over again. You know, just when he thought it was safe to go outside, now polio, a virus. Query whether the deactivation process, the technology you're talking about, will kill things other than COVID, like polio. Yeah, I mean, any kind of virus, it will react with any type of virus. But keep in mind that this is virus that can become particles in the air and then can rise up. Um, you remember early on in the conversation, you talked about them wheeling in this UVC device into a room and the light flash and everybody had to leave. Um, you know, those are more specifically for surface type situations. Um, and, and the great part about that is the UVC light does work in those applications. But as soon as you turn that device off, if someone enters the room with, you know, with COVID or whatever else, um, the effects of that device are gone because the UVC light is already turned off. So that's why early on in the process, you know, we were working with uh, Plan LED to come up with a device that can be on all the time. Because that's the key. Um, because UVC works very well against viruses and all these other things, but it has to be on and it has to be exposed to those. So that's why the upper room disinfection is you know so well, it sounds like a major advance it's a major advance uh from yeah. you know the, the the room the the one that comes into the room and and spins around but yeah. but question you know you were talking before the show about uh, ultraviolet a b and c can you distinguish what those are for us what's the difference definitely definitely so um there are ultraviolet light is invisible we cannot see it we cannot touch it smell it but there are different bands frequency bands and it U, UVCA, as you can see on the screen now, is, I don't know if you've seen on late night TV, they have the ones where you have the glue, you put the glue down and you expose it to this blue light. That's UVA. It's a curing material. It does those kinds of things. UVB is what they use in sun tanning solutions. It's when you go out in the sun and mow the lawn and you get sunburn. So UVB causes sunburn. It causes those types of irritations. It tends to go deeper into the skin. Um, is it carcinogenic? UVB uh, UVB can be, right? That, that's mm -hmm. a leading cause of melanoma and those kinds of things. And that's why there's some significant concern. Yeah. But UVB um, can penetrate deeper into the skin layer, the dermis, than, than mm -hmm. UVC. UVC is in the frequency band, I think, between 130 and 180, uh, somewhere in that range. Please don't quote me on that one. Uh, but it is in a different frequency band, and it is used to disinfect. So when you watch on QVC, you see the little disinfecting machines to disinfect your phones. Um, you've probably seen it. I've seen it on, you know, different fans and different things of that sort that use UVC because UVC light has been proven to disinfect viruses, as we talked about. But there's a couple of critical parts to it that we have to understand uh, yeah. as far as safety and as far as energy output. Well, one, one question comes to mind is uh, if you're going to do this at the top of a room, which I think is really a smart idea. Uh, a, you've got to have a, you've got to have the ability to beam the light. Yes. Because, because if you if you beam it down on people, you know the people that are in that room, you're you know you're you're shooting yourself in the foot, yes. um, and you may be you know doing something you know damaging to them. Um, and, and the other part of my question is, with well, some rooms, some rooms are not very high. Yes. Some some rooms have low ceilings. So, yeah. uh, you know, how how can you make that beam narrow enough so that it's uh, in, a, in a room that may not be that high and so that it doesn't, you know, fall on people? So that's why um, the upper room side comes into play. So the devices that we work with, um, what it does is it gets mounted at about seven feet. 
Um, that means that that means that if you're more than seven feet tall, you should probably stoop down. <laughs> on... it, just, <laughs> it just means if you're over seven feet, you should let us know before we install it. <laughs> I have um, that problem personally. Yeah, yeah you and I both. <laughs> but um, the idea is uh, the bottom of the unit is about seven feet, and they have uh, designed louvers on the front of the UVQ device that then travels light. Um, not horizontally, but in a vertical position upward. And, and what happens is that the energy strengths closest to the unit are strongest, obviously, because that's the closest. So when a virus passes through that band, it's a narrower band, it gets disinfected. But as it gets further away from the unit, you want a wider band so the exposure time is longer. And you talk about the height limitations, but that basically means that we need a certain height ceiling. So usually the minimum that we will do is eight feet um, because it's not just the, the, the band becomes too, the kill zone, they call it, it becomes too narrow, but it's also the fact that there's reflectance off of the ceiling. Uh -huh. So, you know, you talk about the safety aspects of it and that's kind of, that's a critical part to it because it's great if we kill the viruses, but if we do harm to the people below, what's the use, right? I mean, it's still an unoccupiable space. So we do have to make sure that the reflectance of ceilings, of light fixtures, of banners, of different things like that come into play. Well, how do you do that? How do you make sure that it's not bouncing off the ceiling, you know, down, down toward the people? So when we were working with the manufacturer, um, that was one of the critical questions, critical questions, because NIOSH and OSHA do have standards as far as exposure. Um, and these exposure limitations have been around since, you know, I mean, back in, I don't know, 20 years ago when I started installing them. Um, and so they do set limits. I, I believe it's 0.7 micro watts per centimeter square is the designation. And um, there are what they call like dosimeter machines or meters that can measure the energy output. So part of every installation, and, you know, when I was talking to a lot of experts, UVC light is great, but there's two questions that always come up. Is it really doing what it's supposed to be doing and is it safe? So guidelines have been put in place to make sure that it answers those two questions. So when we do an install, um, included in our price is a commissioning of device, which basically means we go and we take with this meter and we check at three feet off the unit, are we getting certain energy strengths? And what was the standard was set was at about 210 microwatts per centimeter squared off the front. And that shows that you can, you're starting to deactivate viruses. Also, it is uh, 0.7 microwatts per centimeter squared at five feet nine, because I guess it was determined that the average height of a person is about five feet nine inches. So, you know, if we cover that level. So as part of our install, it is mandatory. It is mandatory that we do these measurements. And then if there are desks or different things in the room, we'll take readings at different areas just to confirm that we're not exceeding that point. It's not bouncing around. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. The other, I have two other things that, that uh, you know, one is that this is a question of, of um, physics. Um, that is, does, hmm, I love this question, but I, I don't know if anybody knows the answer. Um, no. Does light fall? Is, uh, Einstein could help us. Uh, does, light, <laughs> does light fall? Does gravity affect light? If I shoot a beam of light, you know, uh, out for an infinite uh, distance, is gravity going to drive that beam down? Uh, you know, you're above my pay grade and my university physics uh, got, <laughs> goes a little bit beyond that. But, but you know, the, the unit itself, the disinfecting zone that we're talking about is about 20 feet, 24 feet off the face and from center line about 15 feet in each direction. But keep one thing in mind, um, we're not trying to cover every square footage overhead because the idea is to create these kill zones that get into the airflow. So as long as the areas of primary occupancy are covered, that's the main thing. And as long as there's air movement, because it does require some form, of, some form of air movement, whether it be ceiling fans or air conditioning systems, those kinds of things. Uh, to help circulate the air and then thus get it exposed to these kill zones. So when you when you install then, you may need to install uh, something that will control the airflow, like fans, 
um, air conditioning, what have you, something that will move the air around and move it around in a way that, that comports with this technology, am I right? Yes, and the lucky thing is majority of the classrooms, well, I, I haven't come across them yet that doesn't, either has air conditioning or ceiling fans. You know, it's really common. You know, and then the hospitals, things of like that, restaurants, all those. So most of the occupied spaces in Hawaii have some form of air movement. Yeah. Uh, wasn't uh, David Ige going to put uh, uh, ceiling fans in every classroom? I don't remember. Oh, air conditioning, air conditioning. Air conditioning yep. So the air conditioning, how, you know, how does that affect this? You have to have the air conditioning running a certain way and yeah, I mean, running at a certain height. Am I right? Yes. Uh, yes, that does matter. But, you know, most times air conditioning is set up in that pattern. So when we look at it now, that's why it was kind of critical. You know, we just finished Waimalu Elementary. And the first set of classrooms that he wanted to hit was the special needs classes. Um, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but um, politically correct. But the reasoning why was the DOE and the, it's not just the DOE, it's the CDC, it's the EPA, had came up with designations to reduce the spread of COVID in, in enclosed spaces by increasing the air changes. Um, and what they do is you open the windows um, in the classrooms. And then, so that means you cannot use the air conditioning. So what, um, you know, um, Principal Iwamoto was seeing was that it becomes more distracting for the students because it's warmer one, plus the windows are open, they can hear the noises. And then now they have these great air conditioning systems in the schools and they can't use them. So <laughs> what he wanted to do in those classrooms initially as the first phase was be able to create the equivalent air changes to meet the requirements, you know, of the EPA and, and the DOE and yet still close the windows, close the doors and use the air conditioning. Cause you know, there is the benefit. I mean, it's directly been proven, right? That if you can cool down the spaces or let, make it less humid, the kids are more attentive. Uh, you know, they're less sleepy, just a variety of different things to help that process. Absolutely. I know that, I know that for every, every, <laughs> everybody really, if you know, if it's too hot, you can't think. Yes. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is let's, let's assume you have a bigger room. And you know, in a room, for example, where there is really no problem about the height of the room. However, it's big, and it's you know, it's it's not a, a classroom size of what twenty thirty by twenty thirty. Um, now it's really really big. It's hundreds by hundreds. Um, how do you how do you handle that? How is the installation different when you have a, a big room, say a, a gymnasium, an auditorium, you know, a bigger room? Yeah, so they are being done, and yes, there are limitations. You know, I, I won't, I won't comment to you that this is the, the end all, be all for everything. Um, but so in some of the gyms, you know, they're put along the edges, they're put along above the stadiums, you know, the seating areas, uh, along the common areas, those kinds of things. And as I said, it reaches out about twenty-four feet. So yes, it doesn't reach out to the center areas, but at least it does provide some protection. We are doing some libraries. Uh, we just finished the library at Puuhale Elementary. You know, we put in six, six units inside of that library. Uh, and then you just kind of alternate and you try and create best coverages and you look for the areas where there are airflow and occupancy. And then you try and cover those areas as best possible. So you guys are always, you know, uh, energy industry has always been very creative looking for, you know, the next technology and all that. I remember that, uh, it's impressive. Um, and so this is, you know, to me, uh, especially given the fact that COVID has, uh, has come to visit with us for a long time, um, it, you know, it, this kind of technology is important. But query, are, are you the only guy on the block? Uh, no. Is there anybody else trying this technology here in Hawaii? Uh, I don't know about here in Hawaii, but there are other companies <laughs> that make, you know, the, the, the UV units, the UVC units um, for upper room. And, you know, the, the things that I've talked to with the experts, you know, because I, I was able to talk to some folks up at Harvard and I was able to talk to the uh, environmental specialist for the Department of Education here. And one of the critical things that always is said is UVC lights. Yes, good. It does work. It can be. But you must have the proper energy strength and then also design and safety. So so, you know, when we we talk about situations, um, we, we won't sell these if you just want to buy them. We want to look at the design, the spot location, where is it is, you know, are we going to be in the airflow? Are we above occupied spaces? 
And then also, is it safe? Because one of the very worst things that I've learned doing lighting over the past 28 years is, you know, you can have one complaint and everybody else is positive, but it's that one complaint that's going to be heard. And that's the very first thing that's going to kill your project. Well, yeah, sure. People get scared of everything now. Yes. Uh, I mean, so what, what could happen? I mean, what in, you know, in the science of it, what could happen with UVC? Um, that you know would be a, a, a you know a legitimate complaint. Yeah, so so I have some firsthand knowledge of this. Um, I, I actually was working on some systems for Kamehameha schools on the on the Cal campus, and they have UV lights inside their uh, their air handling units. And I was young and somewhat stupid and lazy, and I said, you know what, this UVC light, that's nothing. I can work in the air handling unit, get my work done, and you know. Don't worry about it. But after about four hours of working in the unit, I began to notice that my eyes began to get, I don't know, it feels like, like sand or conjunctivitis. I don't know if you've ever felt that where it's a little gritty. And then, you know, on my neck and my arms, uh, it was a little red, more red, and, you know, a little bit more sensitive to touch, like almost like a sunburn, but not quite like a sunburn. Um, so I ended up locking up, leaving, uh, and then, that night I went to sleep uh, and, and the next day I was, you know, fine. I went back to work again and this time got smart and turned off the UVC. Um, I don't know the exact technical terms, but that's my understanding is that um, it is most likely to affect the eyes and then also the upper dermis. Is it, is it true, Dwayne, that you used to be blonde? <laughs> <laughs> Joke. Yeah, no. yeah. No. Uh, no, but oh. yeah, no, um, so, so yes it is something that people will notice if they are exposed and and that's the dangerous part about this you you know yes the NIOSH has some pretty um good standards and they talk about leaving the space if exposed those kinds of things and then that's the recovery and and uh you know unless it's very extreme my understanding is permanent damage does not occur uh but still you know it's an irritant right yeah, uh, one other thing I wanted to cover with you, and, and that is this, you know, you said, uh, well, we, we need to see the whole configuration, you know, before we install anything, we got to take a look. But if you really want to know that this is working, you have to look at the the comprehensive, the, you know, the, the hallways, um, the, the bathrooms, I don't know what else, you know, all the rooms, all the spaces in a given school uh, to, you know, to cover it because, you can have mm, crowded gatherings anywhere. Yeah. Um, and if, if this is, um, you know, going to be your method of dealing with, with COVID or anything else, um, you have to cover all the territory. Um, do you do that? Does it work? Do you, do you, do you wind up putting this in every space, uh, in the hallways, the bathrooms, um, you know, the offices, uh, the administration rooms, and so forth? To some degree, no, we haven't seen it to the point of hallways and, and bathrooms and things of that sort. But, you know, we are seeing, you know, cafeterias, um, mm. you know, for Waimalu and Puuhale, we put it in the admin office. Uh, you know, we put it in workrooms, teacher workrooms, um, you know, the classrooms, obviously, uh, you know, and, and we talked about the libraries and, and we're looking at different things and situations. Um, so. Yes, it'd be great if someone did, but you know, we understand there is cost, right? So if you want to focus, you focus on the areas that people spend the most time and the most, con you know, most congested. Um, they really like, you know, so when we did Punahou, we did some of their um, music rooms because that's where people are singing and, you know, expressing oh, sure. and doing those kinds of things. And, and what they found out is that's why churches initially were big spreader groups because that's where people sing and they yell and they, you know, do this kind of thing. And that causes a lot of exhalation, which causes a lot of the potential virus. So, so why, why not go into the air handler the way you, you, you know, you went in that time in your, you know, your anecdote that you told, um, why not just control it through the air handler system of the, of the building? Um, that way you cover all the air, right? Yes, you should do that. But keep one thing in mind is that the airflow through the air handling unit doesn't take 100% of the air. And what has been found by, I think, the EPA and the CDC is that it's the virus that floats up into the air and then circulates and cools down and comes back down before it gets into the air handling unit system that is causing the spread. Uh, 
So yes, don't get me wrong. UVC lighting in the air handling units, a great, great thing uh, and should be done. But what they're finding out is the spread of COVID is occurring in the classroom and not by the circulation of air. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I just, uh, we have a few minutes left and uh, I know that you have uh, your favorite um, uh, 1500 slides you want to show us. <laughs> so let me frame my next question this way. You know, the important thing is proof of concept. When I say proof of concept, I mean that if you take a given school, uh, this is a hard question, take a given school and you have X cases of COVID or, or some bacteriological problem, or some kind of mold problem, or, or uh, not, God forbid, polio, whatever it is, you have X cases on day one, you install this, you know, and on what, six months later, you, you take another snapshot, um, you're going to have a fraction of that, right? Something. And, the, you know, I, and I, I know you have slides that deal with this. So can you take a few minutes, Dwayne, and, and give us proof of concept um, as far as you know, the technology is concerned, the science is concerned, uh, you know, by virtue of all these, uh, these slides. You, you take the first uh, 800 of them, okay? <laughs> well, if we can go to the first slide, which is the one that talks about the history of the use of UVC light. Um, you know, if you can see, actually, UVC light, is it new to COVID? You know, in the 1940s, it was used to combat measles. In fact, I had a picture of an operating room for Duke University back in the 40s, and they were trying to figure out a way that they could do operations on measles patients without it spreading to the doctors. So what they ended up doing is flooding the whole operating room with UVC, and they made the doctors wear, you know, gloves and long sleeves and masks and different things. But, but you talk about proof of concept. So, you know, from the 1940s through the 50s, 60s, up to present day, UVC light has been used to counteract viruses like the Asian flu, like the common cold. Well, I guess the common cold is not a virus, but, um, you know, different well, things. It like could that. very well be. And then, you know, we use tu tuberculosis was an example. So one of the things is this is not something that we just came up with two years ago. It has been proven, it's been tested, and it's been shows that it does work on viruses for the past, I don't know, what is that, 80 years. So one thing, you know, like I said, it's not new technology. It's just the application, trying to figure out how to get it to be more useful. Uh, secondly, the testing after the, you know, after it is installed is critical. Um, most of the groups, ASHRAE is now coming out with requirements and things like that, that show the energy levels at certain distances that must occur for it to deactivate the viruses. So you must have the testing uh, to prove that you are getting these, these energy levels at certain distances away from the device to make sure that it's working. Now, it's been very hard to do a test case where you put COVID in a room and you shine the light on it and you see how long it takes to deactivate and how much is left because uh, the, the CDC doesn't like to give COVID out. Uh, I, I think it's kind of a no, no to, to no, kind of have that. Some, some of the people in Wuhan laboratory <laughs> like to give it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> but um, so, so, you know, I mean, but they, they, it's been proven and it does show and there are requirements. And as long as you can do these post readings, one, you can. On the, the token side of that and nothing scientific, but we've been talking with some of the schools that we've installed. And, you know, we're tra tracing the rooms that have been installed and the ones that don't, and we're kind of going through that. And very early on, uh, Waimalu came to us, uh, you know, elementary a couple of days ago and said, they've had 18 reported cases of COVID. Uh, 14 of the 18 were in rooms without, um, without the UVQ units. And the next thing though, is we wanna see how many other kids in those classrooms have gotten, because Schools are great and you protect the kids while they're in school, but when they go home, when they go to dinner, when they go elsewhere, you know, they may get it there. But what the idea is to try and protect the teachers, try and protect the student, other students and the parents from creating these spreader groups in the schools. That's interesting. I, mean, I, I don't know the answer. Are kids in Hawaii schools wearing masks now? And what's the interaction? Well, see, the thing is, um, they reduce the mask mandate now. Um, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's optional. And that's what's scary, you know, because when we do these presentations for the teachers uh, and, and those kinds of things, 
you know, it's, it's kind of scary for them, right? Because because they don't know where these kids were. I mean, they come to them for, you know, six to eight hours a day. Um, you know, I mean, they don't know if they're wearing masks outside of class or they are, how diligent are their, are their families or what other experiences are they they're running into. So um, it's had great reception from the teachers that there's some form uh, of protection. And keep in mind, this is not the end all. I mean, we're not saying that this UV upper room disinfecting unit is going to solve all the viruses. We're saying it's just another layer of approach. It's masks, it's vaccines, you know, it's wiping down tables, it's social distancing, but it's another layer that we know is effective and can help reduce a significant sure. potential spread. And that, that's science works that way, layering multiple multiple possibilities, each one, yes. you know, having having an effect on the uh, on the outcome. So one other thing you you mentioned the name of the company the name of the company is Plan LED. They're based out of Seattle, out of Gig Harbor in Seattle. Tell us about them. Yeah, so um, we've known them now. We've been working with them now for about 20 years because we did a series of Boeing um, facilities up in Seattle with them. Uh, and they've always been at the very forefront. Um, they're, they're, what was big for them was they were getting into um, classroom lighting and how it affects learning and relaxation and those kinds of things and how you can change the color temperatures and stuff. So they've always been pretty forward in that. And then when COVID hit, um, you know, the, the founder was looking for something because actually it was really interesting. His kids caught COVID um, early on in the process. So he was really trying to figure out what can we do to reduce the potential. Um, and, and so UVC light had always come up. But then it was always, how do we use it and make it active all the time? Not just when we turn the light on and roll it into the room. And so that's where the concept, so he's been doing lighting fixtures for, I don't know, 20 plus years. And so um, he's kind of a little inventor and uh, he came up with the concept about how do we do this? And so, you know, I've been working with him. I, I went through a lot of different things, iterations on this. So. Uh, it's great that he finally came up with a product that is solid. I mean, it's really solid aluminum um, and it's got a lot of safety devices in there. So uh, there's actually a motion sensor because, you know, one of the big things were, hey, the teacher was like, hey, how do I turn this on, turn it off? And we're like, no, just plug it in. We plug it in, we turn it on, leave it alone. It has a motion sensor that automatically turns it off after an hour. Um, and then so if there's motion in the room, it automatically comes back on. We put safety screws in there because we know students like to tamper with things uh, so that it makes it harder for them to open. Because if you open the cover, it exposes everybody to the UVC light. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is there is a dead switch. If you open the cover, the light automatically goes off. So a lot of thought was put in it to, for the classroom environment to make sure you know, we, we student proof it to some degree you know, in, in that regard. Is there any reason why you wouldn't leave it on all the time? Um, well, one is energy. Um, mm. you know, uh, of course, energy. energy industries, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it only takes about 42 watts, which is equivalent to like, you know, a two by four fixture. So it's, it's real small in that regard. But two, once you've dissipated or you clean the air in the space, um, there's no real need for it at that point. Um, so, you know, having it turn off after an hour, it's had enough time to expose any potential viruses in the space. Uh, it, within that hour, and then it shuts off. So, you know, it, it's kind of a win-win, right? One, you don't use as much energy, and then two, uh, nobody has to touch it, and then it activates whenever there is a need for it in the room. Yeah, that's very clever. That's good. Um, so we're, you know, about out of time, Dwayne, but I want to offer you the opportunity to leave a message, leave a message to the parents, the students, the kids, whoever is, is interested in, you know, having this additional layer of protection in the schools and maybe in other institutional settings as well. Uh, what would be your message to them about the future of this technology? You know, the thing is, I think we're all beginning to recognize that COVID or some form of virus, I mean, now you're getting into monkeypox and whatever, you talked about polio, um, it is here, it's with us. And, uh, you know, we need to figure out ways to return to some form of normalcy you know, masks or vaccines. I mean, vaccines are something that's gonna be around. It's been around forever, now it's gonna be this. But if we can figure out additional technologies and things that we can apply, 
light upper room disinfection through the UVC lighting, um, it'll help us return to that normalcy, uh, remove some of the fear, get people, get students back in the classrooms, get teachers more comfortable working in those environments. Uh, you know, it, it's that kind of thing that we see uh, as this is the potential to, to have that. And, and that's why we've been pushing really hard, you know, to try and get into the classrooms first, but it, it applies you know, we were talking to the state about some of their offices now that they're starting to let people back into, you know, um, back into the offices. Those areas would be prime areas because you've got people coming in and coming out and we don't know what the conditions are. So, you know, what we're saying is it's a layered approach. I, I'm by no means saying that this is the cure all for everything, but we need to do things that do not affect our, our lifestyles, but yet provide another layer of protection. Yeah. Don't forget about all those offices downtown where people haven't really made up their minds about whether they want to work in the office or at home. It's, it's still an open okay. question. You know, you know I, I met with the University of Washington and their real estate group, and they don't get paid rents if people aren't in the offices. You know, I mean, it's harder to collect. So he was looking at this device purely from the point of view of providing confidence to people to come back to the office. Sure. So, uh, Confidence. It's very important, you know, side effect of all of this is confidence to exactly. feel like uh, like there's, you know, action being taken. Well, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Dwayne Nashimini uh, of uh, Energy Industries. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate this discussion. I hope it goes well for you. And regards to Darren Kimura, by the way. And also one last point is that, you know, uh, we can't put all your slides on, but we'll put some of them on, <laughs> on on top of this video so, you know, that the viewers will be able to see uh, some of what you're talking about through those slides. Thank you so much, Dwayne. No, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Much appreciated. Thanks, Eric. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.